All right, welcome to a tutorial on the block pattern. Uh, here's a lesson plan. We're gonna go over first what is the block pattern and how is it gonna help us with our state management in a Flutter app. Then we're gonna go over the introduction to the product, uh, the project. I already have a counter service here and we're gonna be making a counter app. Uh, we're gonna define our state class, build the block, build the UI based on block state, and then add some unit tests to both the block and some weighted test to the home screen. So let's get into it first with what is the block pattern. Here we have the plugin we're going to use. It's Flutter Block and it's version 7.3.1. And to learn more about the block pattern, there's a link right here. So the image that we want to pay the most attention to is right here. This is the overview. Right here we have our presentation layer, the UI. And over here we have our block, which is the business logic. The goal of the library is to make it easy to separate the presentation from the business logic, facilitating testability and reusability. So the way that we're going to do that is that UI is only going to know about events that are pumped out to the block, and that's going to emit one or many states. Uh, it could even emit more events back to itself, and then we're going to just build the UI based on those states. So the idea is to encapsulate all the logic for your business logic inside the block so the UI is getting really, really straightforward and simple information like strings and booleans and stuff like that. That makes your UI really, really readable and small um, in code size. And the block is really, really easy to unit test as we're gonna see later. So that's the idea. Uh, it also makes your state reusable across a bunch of different components. You can control the life cycle of a block really easily which means if you want a certain section of your app to have a block, whenever you re-enter it, you get a new initial state. We can do that, or we can have blocks that persist through the entire life of the app. All right, so let's go into the project here. So it's gonna be a counter project again. Um, and I've already written this counter service. And for the purposes of the tutorial, it's got a couple things that a counter would usually not have. First off, it takes a full second to count and after that, there is a random chance that it could fail. So there's a one in three chance that it crashes. So this is gonna be really effective for showing a loading state and a failure state. And it's gonna model a real application a lot better where you're gonna use something like API, downloading files, getting stuff like that, where it's gonna take a lot, enough time that your user is gonna wanna know it's loading, but they don't want their UI thread to lock up. And also those things can crash or fail really commonly if they just don't have internet or something like that. There's going to be a lot of failures that you expect to happen. And you're going to have to be able to handle those. So up here we have um, the abstract class and it just defines what our counter service can do. Uh, this is a lot like an interface, but Dart doesn't have interfaces. Um, but defining an interface here is going to be really useful for mocking and dependency injection later. Uh, so we want to make a crappy counter that fails sometimes and it implements that service. So it just implements that one method there which gets us a future int from that value, which if it succeeds, it's just that value plus one, of course. And the exception that it can throw is a new class that just has this message. So that's the crash that we expect to happen. Okay, after looking at our service, let's define everything in our state. So in our state, we're gonna house everything that is uh, all the moving parts that could change. So first off, obviously we're gonna have a count then we might have an error, we might not, so it's nullable. And also we have a Boolean for whether or not we're loading. And all of these fields are final because this class is immutable. You really want all of your state classes and events, if you have them, to be immutable. Uh, the reason being is that, uh, first off, it's just spaghetti code. If you have just random places mutating the state and you don't know why or when, uh, things could just be very hard to predict and test and it's just gonna be a mess. The other reason is, is that if you mutate this outside of the pattern, uh, your screen isn't guaranteed to rebuild. So the count might be changed in memory, but the screen wouldn't reflect that and that would be very bad. So on the state, we have some getters that are helpful, uh, just a has error, so we don't need to write not equal null all the time, and then some string building. I think that the state is a pretty good place to put string building because if your UI needs to use that string from multiple places, you don't need to build it a whole bunch of different times. And some string building can have enough code that it's really nice to have it unit tested, for example, if it has a bunch of ifs and else's and a bunch of little parts uh, and comma joint stuff. You know, you might want to unit test that and putting on the state is really useful for that. So next up, we just have the constructor and then a factory method to get the initial state. 
Um, having one of these is really nice because we're going to see that the block needs an initial state. And the initial state for this is just zero count, no error, and we aren't loading. Okay, so to mutate the state, what we're going to do is use a copy with. And this copy with idea or pattern uh, is really useful for changing one thing, uh, but making a new instance of that class. So what we're going to do is just put everything that you can pass in, which is count, error, and is loading, and have them all be nullable, and they're all named with the curly brackets, name parameters. So to use this, we're just going to call it, you know, this dot copy with and pass is loading is true or something like that if we want to make it loading. One little issue with this kind of pattern is that if you want to actually clear something and make it null, uh, you're going to have to add something else to it or else it's just going to use the existing value. Because if we try to put a null count and explicitly set it to null, it would just use the existing one. So for the error, we do actually have to explicitly clear it or else we do the copy with over here. Next up, we got a two string. This is for console prints. It makes our tests print really nicely to the console. And also if we want to log the transitions or states to our blocks, uh, that's going to show up nice too. This is not for the user, this is for us. And then these, um, if uh, we're going to override the equality operator. And this is useful for performance um, so that we only need to rebuild the screen when the state is actually different. Because if we have two different instances and they have the exact same data, well, we want those to be equal so that we don't need to rebuild the screen. And if you override the equality, you also need to override hash code. And for that, you can use a handy method from Dart UI to hash all the values together. So the double equals, first we just check if it's the exact same reference. If it is, we don't need to look any further. Or uh, the other is the same class and all the fields are the same, of course. Okay, so that's it for our state. Let's see how that plays into our block. So for the block, we're going to use a class called qubit. And that comes from the block library. Um, but we can see here, a qubit is similar to a block, but has no notion of events and relies on methods to emit new states. Uh, what this means is, is that instead of having to also make counter event classes, we can just put some methods on here, like increment, we only have one right now. Um, and it just makes it a little more straightforward, especially if you don't have a whole bunch of different things going on. This is, this is just a very convenient class to use. Uh, it needs a generic type passed in of the state that we're going to give it. And then when you extend this class, you also need to pass in the initial state to the uh, super constructor here. And it gets the counter service. This is a service that it's going to use to increment with. And just notice that this is the interface like class, the abstract class, and it's not the concrete one. And that's going to be useful for testing later. And it's also good for dependency injection in general. OK, so the one method that it has is increment. And it is asynchronous because uh, Again, the service takes a second to go through. So the first thing that we're going to do is use this method called emit. And emit is going to emit a new state. And all of the widgets from the block library are going to know that they need to check if they need to rebuild. So that's how we get our UI to be reactive. So what we're going to do is just copy our existing state with the loading flag to show, like mark this as loading. And then we're going to try to get our new count from the service. We pass in that existing count from the state. And then if we get one, we're going to throw it into the copy with here and emit a new state with the count inc incremented and the loading flag cleared and the error cleared as well, if there was one. So on counter exception, which is the exception that we know is going to happen, we are just going to say uh, we're not loading anymore and this is our error message. But for an unknown crash for all other exceptions, um, we're going to say an unknown error occurred. And we left this two to here because this is a really good place to add logging to yourself as a developer. So if you have this your app hooked up to Slack or something like that to ping you when it crashes, this would be a great place to log. And the reason for that is we don't know what caused this crash. We have no idea. Maybe it was some null, nullable issue or something like that. Um, we'd want to know about this if this was crashing frequently in our app. So that's the whole class. It's not really that much code. Uh, but we're going to see that it's really powerful when we look at our UI. OK, so the first thing that we need to look at for the UI is main. And we're just going to instantiate our crappy counter. And then we're going to pass that into my app. And then we're going to call run app, of course. So the main widget that we need to uh, use here is the block provider. And block provider, you need to pass in a create. And this is a function that is going to build your block. So it's going to return us that counter qubit, which is a block. And that needs the service. Uh, we don't need the uh, build context to build our block. In fact, I, I think that you should keep a build context separate from your block uh, and not have it rely on the being in a widget tree. But 
Uh, what this widget is going to do is for everything underneath it in the tree, it's going to be able to look up via build context your counter block. <clears throat> That's really important for uh, another widget that we're going to see on the home screen. So on the home screen here, we have a block builder. Block builder is going to, via build context, look up uh, based on the classes that you provide uh, an instance of a block that matches those things. So it's going to look up a counter qubit that has a counter state. You can also pass in the block directly, but I don't recommend doing that because then all of your widgets need to know, uh, have a reference to that block and it'd be kind of annoying to pass around. You don't need to, it can just look it up. This is much easier. So as that performance optimization I was talking about, we can do build when. Uh, build when is going to return a boolean for whether or not we need to actually rebuild the screen. We're going to get a new state and by default it'll always rebuild the screen. But we don't actually need to rebuild if it's not different. So this is just an example. Uh, we know in this project that every mutation is going to lead to a different state, but it's theoretically possible that you could omit the exact same state as before, uh, in which case we don't really need to rebuild the screen. So it gives you a builder and that's where you return your widget. So here's our screen with our app bar. And now it's not very pretty, uh, but the point is just to show you that you can build your screen based on that state and it's going to be reactive to that state. You're going to get a new state. You don't have to do anything to rebuild your screen. You don't have to call set state. You don't have to think about it as a developer, which is really, really nice. That's called reactive UI. So we're always going to have the counter label, which is here. And then if there's an error, there's another text. And if it's loading, we get the loading message. And then we have the floating action button. And it has, it's, as it's on pressed, it's going to be linked up to that increment method. So we're going to use the context.read and find that block via context again, and then call increment. Uh, because increment has no inputs and neither does on pressed, we can just pass this function in as though it was an object on pressed. We don't need an anonymous function there, which is quite nice. So that's it for the UI. Let's try it out. So count to zero. We expect it to either count up or crash. And that's what it does. All right, so it works. But uh, it's always good to prove that it works. Right? And we can prove that it works via unit testing. So in order to do that, uh, we are going to need some dev dependencies. Uh, the first that we're going to need is Mockito, and then we're going to need Build Runner. So Mockito is what we're going to use to mock out our classes, and then we can make it so that our unit test runs the exact same way, and we're going to tell, tell it, you know, when we call increment, this is what's going to happen, and we're going to set that up and mock it up. And Build Runner is needed to build a generated file. And then Block Test also helps us with uh, testing the block for um, some stream builder type boilerplate is hidden behind here, and it makes it really, really easy to test multiple states popping out in a row. So first, let's check out mocks.dart. This file is really small. Uh, but one important thing is that this command here is just really long and kind of annoying. So I like to put it in my code or somewhere easy to access so that I can put it in my terminal and then run it really easily. Uh, this delete conflicting outputs flag is going to completely regenerate the file, which is usually what you want. I always use this option. And the two classes that we're going to mock are the qubit and the service. So we write this file, we run this command, and then we get a file mocks.mocks.dart. And this just has a bunch of gross generated code that stubs out everything. And you notice that everything just has like no such method errors. Uh, that's because you're going to have to mock the things. You have to tell it what to do. So let's see how that works in our unit test in the counter block test here. OK, so first we got uh, void main and we got a group of tests. I like to put the class name in here. It makes it print to console really pretty. And then we're going to have a bunch of tests. And we're not going to use test widgets. We're going to use test because we don't need to build context. We don't need any widgets. The block is a business logic. <clears throat> so the first test here, checking that initial state is initial state, uh, which seems like it's obvious. But this test has a bit of a weird thing to it, which is that if we didn't override that equality operator, this test wouldn't work because there'd be two different instances of the state and it wouldn't be equal. But because we said if every field is equal, you're equal in that equality operator, uh, this test will pass here. Uh, okay, so now we're going to get into a little bit more complicated of a test. We have a block test. And you have to go to pass in the types again. And what block test does is it gives you these three things, build, act, act and expect. So we can set up our test, act on the block, and then expect one or multiple or maybe even none uh, states to pop out. So this test reads, increment emits a loading state 
and then puts the result of a service into count. So to build, we're going to build our mock service and we're going to pass that into the counter qubit. And build needs to return you a block and it's got to match this class. And then in here we have the when. And when comes from Makito. And what it's going to do is say, uh, we're going to say, you call increment with anything, any is just uh, kind of a matcher, argument matcher. Uh, you call increment with anything, we're going to return a value of one. And it's going to be asynchronous, so it's like a future value of one. So in act, we call block.increment. And <clears throat> what we expect to happen if you increment and that service gives us one is first we mark as loading, and then we get that count of one. So that's the test, and it's really quite easy to test this. So you could picture if you had like a bunch of states pop out. Um, that's a lot of asynchronous gross code to test that without this plugin. So this, this uh, dependency is really nice, and it's got some more options here if you need to do more uh, complicated things as well. And there is another test down here to do the same, but for the error. So increment emits a loading state and then puts error of service into state. We do pretty much the same thing, except when we're mocking it, we're going to throw one of those counter exceptions. And then we're just going to make sure that we're marked as loading, and then that error gets put into there, and our loading flag is cleared when we do the same thing, which is act. So that's the test for the blocks. Um, I, hope you see, I hope you can see how easy it is to unit test these and how important it is. So the block is the brains of your app. And if the brains aren't working right, the side effects could be really, really hard to understand or see. So testing every single path that events can take uh, from any initial state and testing as many of those permutations as you can is really, really important. Uh, and since block makes it so easy for you, that's one reason why this pattern is so amazing. <clears throat> Next, we're going to go to the widget test. I didn't write quite as many widget tests because I don't think there's quite as much value in them, but still they're here. So what we can do is do the same thing, but we're going to use test widgets, and that's going to give us access to this widget tester. Uh, so I only wrote one test, and just show you how this mocking would work. So shows a loading text when counter qubit is loading. So we're verifying that when that loading flag is true, this text appears. So now instead of mocking the service, we're going to mock the block itself. And this test has no idea uh, that the service even exists, and our UI doesn't either. And that's a really good thing. That's um, separations of concerns and splitting your app into really nice layers. Um, that's a good sign that the architecture is really powerful. Uh, it's also just a sign that our unit testing is easy and effective. <clears throat> so when we're, uh, what we're going to mock now is instead of the service, we're going to mock the state itself. So when block.state, we're going to return that initial state, but with a loading flag. Uh, the widgets that build the screen listen to the stream. So we need to mock this, but that's just so that the uh, test doesn't crash. Uh, this doesn't actually do anything for the purposes of our test, except for make it run. So we use widget tester, and we pump the widget. And we're going to need to wrap this in material like most widgets. <clears throat> now we're going to do the block provider with that uh, counter qubit there. And this block is the mock block, of course. And the home screen has no idea whether the block is real or not. Uh, but it's just going to build itself based on that state there. So we expect to find a test uh, text with loading, and it finds one of them. So let's run those tests. Come on. Took way longer than normal, but that's okay. The pass. And then I forgot to run these ones, but let's run these as well. That was a little faster. So we can see here the counter state uh, two string coming into play here makes the console output and the test output really nice because if a test were to fail, it's going to tell you a nice message. It's going to say, hey, we expected a counter state of one null false, uh, but we actually got a counter state of something else. And if you don't put that two string, it's just going to say, we expected an instance of counter state, and we got an instance of counter state, uh, which obviously doesn't make any sense. So yeah, that's that. That's the, uh, that's the tutorial. So we looked over what is the block pattern, and then we looked at the state, the block, and some unit tests and widgets. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any ideas for other tutorials, let me know in the comments.